Good evening. So happy to be here with everybody this evening back in Lubbock. Allie and I were in Amarillo this morning, and so we missed worshiping with you here, but there's good work going on in other places in the kingdom, so it's an exciting time to be here back together to worship God. Um, that's what we've been doing. I mean, if we're honest about what we do in all of our lives, it's worship to God. We just have a special time here on Sundays where we get to be together with people of like faith and mind to sing together, pray together, and most importantly, partake of these emblems that we got to partake of today. Now the point in our service has come where we get to study from God's Word together. So I invite you, if you're here this evening, if you're tuning in online, wherever you may be, open your Bibles up with me tonight. We're going to be in the book of James. James chapter 1, as, as you're turning over there, I just want to express my gratitude for the opportunity to be able to present to you a portion from God's Word. It's a special time for uh, the fourth Sunday night of the month for people like myself who like to try some of this, that the elders have given us the opportunity to do so. So I'm thankful to the elders for that, and I appreciate all of you for being here. And um, hopefully something that we talk about this evening will be valuable to you. Should be, it's from the Word of God. If it's not, come talk to me about it, and, and let's make sure we're on the same page and get into the Word. James chapter 1. I'll be reading from the New King James Version this evening. James chapter 1, I just want to begin here in verse 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. Now, a lot of times when we do a textual type study in a letter, we take this introduction to the letter and we breeze by it really quickly because there's not a lot of content. There's so much that comes later in the letter that we don't spend very much time on these. I don't really want to spend a ton of time tonight in this first verse. I actually preached this sermon in Abilene a few weeks ago and probably spent a good like 20 minutes in verse 1 just talking about some of the words and, and uh, finding some significance. I don't want to do that tonight. I want to keep moving along, but just a couple of thoughts from this. This uh, James that, that wrote this epistle, uh, there's maybe some debate over who it is, but I think most people agree that James is the brother of Jesus. Uh, Jesus' fleshly brother. Uh, just some interesting facts about James. James being Jesus' brother, there was a point in James' life where he witnessed Jesus' physical ministry on the earth, yet he rejected Jesus as the Messiah. We see in John chapter 7 and verse 5 that even his brothers did not believe in him. So, so starting out, if this is the brother of Jesus, we have a man who's already had this journey of faith where he's gone from complete total rejection of Jesus. How on earth could you possibly be the Messiah? We see that throughout. And I think all four of the Gospels are in agreement on this. There's a point in time where James does not believe in Jesus as the Messiah to one of the prominent church leaders in Jerusalem. We see in Acts chapter 15, Acts chapter 15, we see that there's a council gathered in Jerusalem to discuss the, uh, the issue of circumcision. There were, as we know in, in our personal studies, and as it plagued the first century church, we see throughout much of the New Testament, circumcision was an issue. People wanted to enforce circumcision on those whom it did not apply to. And we see in this council that, that the congregation of people that were gathered together listened to Paul and Barnabas as they spoke about the miracles and signs that God worked through the Gentiles. And we see in verse 13 that after they had become silent, it was James, and I believe this is James, Jesus' brother, the same guy who wrote this epistle that spoke up. He says, after they became quiet or silent, James answered saying, men and brethren, Listen to me. And he goes on with his, um, with his speech. I think it's just important to note that James spoke with authority. He spoke in the same platform as Paul and Barnabas. This man has really taken a journey from rejecting the Messiah to being a prominent leader in the church. And he identifies himself as a bondservant. This idea of being a bondservant. It's metaphorically one who gives himself wholly over to another's will. I see Caleb squinting to read the definition, so I obviously didn't make the font big enough. 
But it says, metaphorically, one who gives himself over to another's will. Those whose service is used by Christ in extending and advancing his cause among men. It's used of apostles, of preachers and teachers of the gospel, and of true worshipers of Christ. I think there's maybe two reasons why James identifies himself as a bondservant of Christ. The first, I guess maybe three. The first is to establish authority. The things that he, are speak, that he is speaking are from God. He is a servant of God. He's given himself over to God. He's speaking on God's behalf. The second thing would be this idea of credibility. If, if he's speaking with the authority of God, he's establishing, establishing himself as credible because he is from God. He is working for God. But it's also commonality. He's speaking to the brethren on their level. I never really thought about the fact that this idea of bondservant, as it actually translated, includes those who are true worshipers of Christ. We talk a lot about those who give themselves over to Christ. We talk a lot about that aspect of it. We look in, in Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 23, just a couple quotes from this section of verse. Uh, Having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So now present your members as slaves of righteousness. For holiness. It's, you want to learn more about what being a bondservant is, go to Romans chapter 6 in those verses. But it, but it speaks to those who truly worship God in spirit and truth. The people who he's writing to are fellow bondservants. That's, that's an amazing thing. It, it established that commonality that they have. Uh, then he addresses this to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Uh, we refer to these people a lot of times as Messianic Jews, people who, who converted from Judaism to Christianity, people who, I mean, these people who he's writing to likely would have been some of the people back in, in Acts 15 who were causing some of the problems over circumcision. But more importantly than that, I want to consider these people's journey for just a minute. The 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. The church began in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. The people who were there were Jews. In Acts chapter 2 verse 5, it says, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Think about that for a minute. On the day of Pentecost, there's Jews from every nation under heaven who have come to Jerusalem to this one place to partake in this holy day. And we know how the story goes. Peter gets up, he preaches, and following that sermon in verse number 41, we read that that day, 3,000 souls were added to the church. So there were men from other nations who come to Jerusalem, they hear these sermons, and they're baptized. Now consider what they left just to be in Jerusalem in the first place. These people left home. They left probably family friends, jobs, their source of income. They left these things behind in their home nation to come to Jerusalem to worship God and their lives were changed completely. They're baptized. They become believers of Jesus. And they didn't immediately go back home. We see in verses uh, 44 through 47, we aren't going to read all of these, but, but in these verses we see that, that the disciples stayed together in Jerusalem. They stayed together. They had all things in common. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and teaching. They shared all things. They, they broke bread together. They had all things in common. These people stayed together in Jerusalem. There was sacrifice involved in being a Christian. Then you work your way through the book of Acts. You see all the things that they would have witnessed. And the Lord continued to add to the church. And these brethren continued to stay together. Until we get to Acts chapter 8. When this great persecution arises against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says, They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. These people, they, they've left their home, they left, they've left all this stuff behind, they've come to Jerusalem, they've seen these great things happening, and now they're finally forced out of Jerusalem. And they're scattered because of persecution. Now, I wanted to spend a little bit of time lingering on that because this idea has, has been on my mind and it might have been on some of yours uh, over this last week. We, we see our world is um, <laughs> changing maybe right now. 
Uh, we, we really don't know what, it, what our world is going to look like going forward because of some of the events that are happening in Eastern Europe right now. We, we see, you know, and the point of the sermon is not to get up here and talk about Russia and Ukraine the whole time. I don't want to make this a political statement or anything. But I did notice as I was um, reading some of the stuff about this conflict that's taking, this war that's taking place, as Russia's coming into Ukraine, if, if a foreign army coming into this country, I've seen a couple things that were encouraging and maybe a little bit shocking to me. I saw a video a few days ago of a group of Christians gathered together in a metro station in Ukraine as Russia was at the border singing praises to God. I've seen pictures of Christians continuing to gather together as the enemy pushes their way through Ukraine. I saw pictures of an individual being baptized as their life around them is crumbling, everything is completely changing. There are people there who are continuing to look to Jesus. And it's a powerful thing that we see going on there. And, and it's something that, that we may be experiencing here one day. And as I think about those things that are happening in the world and, and Christians that are being displaced and, and their lives that are being changed, and I think about the reality that that could be us, I couldn't help but think of James. You, you can't not think of James when you really think about who he's writing to. James is writing to Christians who are being persecuted. Christians who have been displaced. Christians who have given up a lot to be where they're at, yet they're forced out yet again. And, and there's uh, some things here that, that I think that, that, that are a benefit to me as I think about these things, and so I hope they are to us as well. As we go on, chapter, verse 1, simply a greeting, but as we move forward to uh, chapter, or verse 2, rather, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. That's so backwards, right? We, we think of various trials, and, and I, don't, I don't know, but, but I'm of the belief that, that he is not specifically and solely referring to spiritual trials. These people were being persecuted. Their lives, their physical well-being was being put in jeopardy. So we extend that to us today. We think about the trials that we face. They could be physical, mental, emotional. They could be spiritual. Whatever trials, whatever various trials you face, rather than be brought low by those, rather than being torn down away from Jesus, count it, count it all joy. Count it all joy. You know, we've talked about this frequently when we talk about joy. Happiness and joy are not necessarily the same thing. Happiness is the outward expression that we have. I mean, it's how we feel outwardly, but joy is what's from the heart. From the heart, when we fall into various trials, we're to be joyful. And he tells us why. It's not because we're being beat down. It's because we know that the testing of our faith Whatever our trials are, at some point, if they get bad enough, they'll test our faith. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. There's righteous fruit that can be uh, produced. It's growing through trials. The one that he specifically identifies here is patience. But let patience have its perfect work. Now I'll be the first to tell you, patience takes a lot of work for me takes a lot of work for me to have patience. I, I've always been told I have a short temper. And so this idea of patience to me, that's a lot of work. But the thing is, is if we put in the work to have patience in our lives, patience works in our life. It's not just, it doesn't just take work to have patience. Patience works on us. Let patience have its perfect work. That you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. This idea of perfection that James talks about here, I don't believe he's talking about the idea of being completely without fault. If you go back and you translate this word, I, I think the idea that he's talking about here, he, he 
elaborates on this idea of completeness, lacking nothing. Uh, maybe a better word is maturity, that you may be mature. And the idea is, is that you have this well-rounded life that doesn't have holes all in it. it it's, it's, it's made whole and mature because of what God is working through us through these trials. It, it's a pretty powerful thing. He goes on, if any of you lacks wisdom... Let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. So James just got through talking about what it takes to be perfect, complete, and then he's like, okay, now if you lack this, ask of God. Specifically, he's talking about wisdom. I don't know how we get through trials without wisdom. If we don't have the wisdom to see past the physical things immediately in front of our faces, how can we get through those trials? The wisdom of God sees beyond the physical. The wisdom of God sees sees the spiritual results that James was just talking about in the prior verses. So if you don't have that wisdom, the type of wisdom that sees beyond the physical, ask of it from God. Ask of it from God. Because God will give it. There's a way in which we're to ask, though. And, and so he's talking about wisdom specifically here, but the lesson that he's about to talk about applies to prayer holistically. When you go to God in prayer, you go to Him in faith with no doubting. That's hard to do. It's hard to go to God in our human wisdom and, and go there with absolutely no doubting. But what aren't we doubting? What should we have faith in? What does this look like? You, well, you ask in faith. You ask in faith. I think we should just define faith, right? Hebrews 11, verse 1. Everybody knows this. It's our, I don't know, our traditional definition of faith. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We're just told that, that God will give liberally and without reproach, so we should ask in faith. There should be substance to why we're going to God. And that substance is because God has, first of all, told us that he's going to answer our prayer. You ask me, I'm going to do it. But we go back and we, and we go through the pages of Scripture and we look time and time again of when God promised His people something, what happened? God followed through. God is faithful. The Lord's not slack concerning His promises as some count slackness. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. God is faithful. God has promised and God will answer. So we can go to God in faith because we've seen God answer our prayers. We know He will answer our prayers. We go to Him in faith. We don't need to doubt. I think there's a difference between going to God in faith and going to God with expectations. Going to God in faith, knowing that God has the power and ability to answer my prayers in the best way possible as He sees fit is different than going to God with like, this is how you're going to help me, God. There's a quote from a movie, um, Evan Almighty, Morgan Freeman plays the God character in this movie, and he's having a conversation and he says, let me ask you something. If someone prays for patience, do you think God gives them patience? Or does he give them the opportunity to be patient? If he prayed for courage, does God give them courage? Or does he give them opportunities to be courageous? If someone prayed for the family to be closer, do you think God zaps them with warm, fuzzy feelings? Or does he give them opportunities to love each other? The point of the quote is, is sometimes we go to God and we, we just expect things to happen in the way our human wisdom sees fit. But that is not how God always answers prayers. God will answer his prayers in his time, in his way, in the best way possible to suit his plan. And we need to have the wisdom to see that. Going to God with expectation is not the same as going in faith. We should go in faith and believe that God will answer prayers. 
Because He said He will. The person who doubts when they pray, He says, He uses this illustration. They're like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. There's no stability in that. There's, there is no stability. He calls them unstable in all their ways. There's no stability. I have never been on a boat in, out in the ocean. I've been on the lake before. And, and just the little waves of the lake, you're on the boat and you can feel the rocking back and forth. Can you imagine the great waves of the sea that just flow this way and that with the wind, however it's blowing, the waves go. And they're big and some small and, and some dangerous, some not so much. You just never know what you're going to get. It's never the same. And the person who goes to God with doubt in their heart is that type of person. There's just no consistency, no stability. And so why should you expect God to answer your prayers then? As we think about these things in, in James 1 verses 2 through 8, really the point of what he's getting at is that we should be a prayerful people as we endure trials. We need to be self-evaluating, looking at ourselves. Where are we lacking? How can I do better? Give me wisdom to get through this. And God will. God will. And the end result of trials will be better than when we entered them. When we have godly wisdom, it can work in our lives for good. To move on to verse 9, eight, this is where James gets confusing for me because there's some things like this that just almost seem completely out of place at first. Like, we've just been talking about trials. Now we're going to talk about rich people and poor people. He says, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but let the rich in his humiliation, because of the flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with the burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower fails, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. I think there's a couple of things there that really do actually fit in with what's being talked about here. There is nothing wrong with being happy when God blesses us. In fact, in the, to the people, to the lowly brother, when, when he is exalted by God, the lowly brother is told he can glory in that. He can praise God for that. It's not a boastful, prideful thing, but it's a glorifying God thing. I, I've been exalted because of you, God. Praise God for what you've done in my life. The rich, on the other hand, he says when, when you're made low, when, when you're humiliated, you glory in God in that. And he tells us why. Because, because the physical things that you have, those physical things are going away. They are not forever. The things here on this earth do not last forever. So why do we have confidence in them? It's not a problem when God blesses us in our lives to say thank you God for what you've done. But our confidence should not be in those things. They're going away. God is not. And I think that's kind of how this fits in. We're, we're talking about trials. We think about here in America, we, we think about how few trials we really face. Well, we better not glory in that because we don't know how long that's going to last. But God, God will last. God will still give. God will provide. And I think that's how that starts to fit into these trials. The idea here between verses 9 and 11, I think, is just the idea, focus not on the physical. To refocus, focus away from the physical, focus on what God is really doing. He goes on in verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it, brings, or it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. So, so as we're going through trials, these things at some point will begin to affect our faith. He, he talked about the testing of our faith earlier, right? And at some point, temptation comes. So blessed is the man who endures temptation. Why is he blessed? Well, he's blessed because there's a crown of life waiting for him. 
when he's approved, when, when this life is over, when the physical things are over, he'll be given that crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. That's an encouraging thought. There's a crown of life waiting for me. I just have to endure temptation. But so often when we are tempted and we're faced with trials, we want to point the blame back to God. Well, God, how could you, how could you have allowed me to be here? Even if we don't directly say, God, why did you tempt me? A lot of times we look to God and we want to place the blame of, why did you put me here? Why did you allow my life to get here? And God's saying, no. Let no one say when they're tempted, I'm tempted by God. It's not God's fault that you're being tempted. God's not tempted by evil. He's not going to tempt you with evil. But temptation, he talks about what it, he defines it. You want to know what temptation is? Well, it's the result of our desires. Our, our natural desires, when, when we're drawn away by those desires and enticed, there's temptation. You see, the things that we feel and think in our heart in and of themselves, while they must be under control, don't hear me wrong, I'm not saying you can just let whatever in, but, but in and of themselves are not the problem. It's what we do with them. Those desires, thoughts, and intents of the heart, when, when we're drawn away by those and they consume us, that's when the problem begins. And so, and so when, when you're drawn away by your desires, uh, they're enticed, then when desire has conceived, when, you, when you're like, okay, now it's consuming enough, I've got to do something about it. It's conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it, when it comes into my life, it takes over. When it's full grown, it brings forth death. We know Romans 6 verse 23, the wages of sin is death. The consequence of sin is death. We're the ones who have control over what temptation does in our life. We have to bring ourselves under control in submission to God. He goes on, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Don't be deceived. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of His own will, He brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. And there's this saying about sin. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, cost you more than you want to pay. How true is that? Sometimes we get to the pit of sin and as, as James was talking about, we, we point that blame back at God. James is saying, don't be deceived. Don't get this wrong. It's not God who does that, but what God does, He's the giver of good gifts. He's the giver of perfect gifts. That's what's from above. It comes down from the Father of lights. There is no variation or shadow of turning. God is consistent. God is faithful. He brought us forth from His own will by the word of truth that we might be of first fruits of His creatures. We are God's. And we are here because God has allowed us to be. God has given us that gift. He's given us the gift of life. He gives us these blessings that so often we overlook. You know, we think about temptation in the context of all of this, and we want to blame God for where we're at, but what about 1 Corinthians 10, 13? With temptation, what does God do? He provides a way of escape. God's the giver of good gifts. He doesn't want us to cave to temptation. He gives us a way out. He's consistent. He wants us to be His. He wants us to choose to be His. Because that's the life He's given us. But think about verse 12 through verse 18. He really just gives us the right perspective as we go through trials and temptations. And so going forward with those perspectives in mind, he says in verse 19, So then, my beloved brethren, knowing that we are gods, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, 
For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. And boy, do I get those out of order a lot. <laughs> I like to talk. I like to talk. I, I'm an instinctive talker. There's problems. I'm going to talk about it real quick. We were talking about this the other night. I'm the person who wants to get out there and just my tongue's going to go. I'm going to say what's on my mind. And God's like, no, that's backwards. Listen first. Talk second. When we have that in the right order, wrath doesn't really have room to come in. And the reason why we can't let wrath in is because wrath does not produce the righteousness of God. You know, the Holy One has called us. Be holy. Why? For He is holy. Be holy. We, we cannot get these things out of order. God expects holiness from us. He expects us to be set apart. To, to choose not to sin. To choose things that produce righteousness. We cannot get these things out of order. And so if we're to do that, we have to lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Now, I've heard this joke before and I like it, so I'm going to share it again. It's not just like the stuff that spills over the top. You can't have your little bit of wickedness down here because it's not overflowing. That's not what he's talking about. we got to get rid of wickedness. There's no place for it. It's not like, okay, so long as it's not filthy, if it's just a little bit wicked, we can keep it. It all has to go. It all has to go. It has to get out of the way for a reason, though. That way we can receive the implanted word that can save our souls. We've got to get rid of these fleshly things. These are the qualities that, that really produce righteousness. We've got to get rid of those things to have the new things. So he goes on at the end of this chapter. He says, but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So there, there's a couple different people here. There's a person who's received... The implanted word which can save their soul. And they're like, okay, I heard it. <laughs> I listened. What, what does this kind of remind you of? To me, my mind goes to the parable of the sower, right? You think about the type of heart that, that receives the word and, and hears it, but, but doesn't do anything about it. What happens to that seed? Well, it's not going to grow. Nothing's going to happen. So we're to be doers of the Word. It's not enough to sit here on a Sunday and like, alright, I heard the Word for the week. I'm done. I think that's one of the most important things about noting that, that James is not written to a local church. It is not written to a collective church body of believers. This is written to individual Christians. The things that James is writing about applies to us most directly in our lives Monday through Saturday. Outside of what happens in these four walls when we're here for the few hours we're here on a Sunday morning and the hour we're here on Wednesdays. Outside of these walls, this is what James is talking about. It, it's easy enough to come in here and sing and pray together and to open my Bible while I'm here. But what am I doing outside? What am I doing every day? And now take it to Monday. Am I, am I simply opening my Bible when I wake up Monday morning and reading John 1? That's where my Bible said. John 1. I read John 1. Okay, now what? I go to work and I immediately forget about it. You know, there, there's... A complete change that's expected. And it's not enough just to take in the Word from time to time and expect my life to change completely. It's not going to happen. 
We can't expect it to happen when we simply, like, all right, I heard it. And he uses an illustration. It's like if you wake up in the morning, you roll out of bed, and you walk to your mirror, and you're like, all right, here I am. What you see is what you get. And you turn around and you walk away and you do nothing about what you see in that reflection. For me, I would look pretty ridiculous. You know, my hair's going everywhere. You know, I'd, I would look like I just rolled out of bed. Mirrors are there for a reason. And so I look put together. <laughs> but if I only look in the mirror at the beginning of the day and I never go, you know, at work, adjust the tie, you know, make sure everything's still on straight before you walk into your important meeting, like we do those things without even really thinking about it. Yet, when it comes to the Word of God, the, the mirror that really shows us our spirituality, we like look into it on Sunday morning and are like, great. I'm done. And, and that's, that's what it's like. It's supposed to be silly. Like, like to think about it that way, it's like supposed to kind of make you chuckle. Because we know we wouldn't just look in the mirror and walk away and be like, who cares? We wouldn't do that. And so there's this transition here. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, the one who genuinely gets into the Word of God and continues in it. They don't just read it from time to time. It's a part of them. It's a part of everything they do. They continue in it all the time. They're not just a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work. This is not a storybook. This is like a pathway. God is like, he, He's laid out exactly what we're supposed to do in our life. Like, go this way. Go this way. Over and over. Go this way. And they aren't different ways. It's all one way. It's the way. Jesus says, John 14, I am the way. And God has given us that way. He's given us the work that we're supposed to do. So the one who, who gets into the Word, makes it a part of their life, and does the work. They walk on the way. This one will be blessed in what He does. We can't expect as, to be just hearers of the Word and to endure trials and temptations as James talking about through this whole text. James doesn't write like a linear story here. There's not just like one theme that goes throughout. He, he kind of writes in these proverbial type statements that you have to kind of piece together like a puzzle. Like it's not all that confusing of a puzzle if you really pay attention to what he's talking about. But when you start piecing these things together, man, you can't have these things without the culmination of the rest. They're all important. To endure trials and temptations, we've got to be doers of the work. I mean, it, it all flows together when we really think about it. And so as he like, wraps up this chapter, he says, if anyone among you thinks he is religious, how many here think you're religious? We're here right now. That speaks for itself, right? If you think you're religious and you don't bridle your tongue but deceive your own heart, this one's religion is useless. I want to ask us to raise our hands now. Who has trouble bridling their tongue? I've already admitted, so I'll raise my hand. But like, like, let's be for real here. I mean, I, I don't think this is limited solely to the tongue. I don't think that's the, the whole point. He's going to talk about the tongue a lot in chapter 3. And he's going to really get into the specifics about the tongue. How such a small member of the body can, can cause such destructive damage. And unless we're able to bring the tongue into control, it doesn't matter what the rest of the body's doing. So he's like kind of foreshadowing what he's talking about, what he's going to talk about later. But if we take the principle and apply it to our lives, we can't just let these little parts of our life go so long as the rest is in check. We can't have our one little sin over here so long as everything else is good. That's not, that's not the point. If we're doers of the work, if we're going to be perfect, complete, lacking nothing, there's not going to be that little piece that, that's out of place. And so the conclusion is, P 
pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Pure and undefiled religion. This idea of religion as it's used here is translated as religious worship. And for a long time I was like nervous about even talking about this verse if I was going to throw out a definition there because that's not worship, right? That's not singing. That's not reading the Bible or praying together. And I don't mean to, be a, to mock anybody, but like, let's be real. I'll point you back to Caleb's sermon from January on worship. That's the type of worship that's being talked about here. He's writing to a Jewish people who would have understood when, he, when the word religion is used, it's like an all-encompassing lifestyle. Every aspect of the Jewish faith had to, like, every part of their life was covered. Every part of their life had to be in check. Their, their cultural, civil law, all of that was like in conjunction with the religious law. There was not a big separation like we try to make in our, in our life. You know, silly example, but the speed limit. You know, how many people like, you know, go cruising down the road and just, it was a nice suggestion at 50 down here on whatever. You know, we are booking it way past that. You know, that, how many of us do that? You know, we, we try to separate the way we live from religion. But religious worship, as it's being talked about here, is this all-encompassing lifestyle. Everything that we do is for the glory of God. 1 Peter chapter 4. Whether we speak, whatever we act, all things are done that God may be glorified. So this pure and undefiled religion, as he's talking about here, is three-directional. It's up before God the Father... It's in accordance to His will. It's in accordance to that reflection we see back from the perfect law of liberty as we were talking about before. It's out towards others. Specifically here, orphans and widows. How many of us shuddered? I would have shuddered, right? Orphans. We're, we're in church and we're talking about orphans for a long time. And Nate knows I've talked to him about this. You know, this sort of thing makes me uncomfortable sometimes. Why? Because we want to separate the work of the church from the individual work. And there is a separation. There is. The work of the church is not to do these things. But as Nate asked me when I was talking to him about this, when's the last time you helped an orphan or a widow? Like, there is a specific thing that we're supposed to be doing, and he says it's helping orphans and widows. The broader application is that we are a people that looks for those who are in need, and we're servants to those people. But finally, when this religion is pointed in at ourselves, there's no element of it that's about self-gratification and doing what I want, but it's keeping myself unspotted from the world. This last little bit of James chapter 1, as I understand it, is simply just be doers, not hearers only. I mean, he just makes it so simple. And so as, I, as we wrap this up tonight, what does my reflection show me tonight? If I were to open up the Bible and go through the New Testament pattern that we have, what does it say about who I am? And if we aren't willing to do that, then we miss the whole point of James chapter 1. And so if you're here tonight, I want you to think about that. I need to think about that. What, what does my life really look like in comparison to the life God expects me to be living? Regardless of the physical things that are coming, regardless of the physical things that are currently happening, whatever trials or temptations I am facing right now, you are facing right now, how does my life line up with the Word of God? And we need to be honest about it. I mean, if, if, as we were talking about with the tongue, if we're willing to let just this one little thing go, the whole thing is useless. So where are you tonight? I have work to do. I have work to do. And, and I'm very thankful for a congregation like this, that I know I have people that I can go to that, that are going to help me. I can go to people and... and Get advice and, and 
Prayers. More than advice. Prayers. And people that will help me. And I know I have that. And whoever you are out there, it's like, yeah, I got work to do. You need to understand that, that we have you too. We're here to pray for you. We want to help you. If there's that little thing in your life that you just can't get rid of, that it's, that it's just latched on, I mean, let us know. Let us pray with you. Let us help you. But if you're here tonight and you are not a Christian, you, you haven't taken the first steps of getting on this path, man, we would love for you to do that tonight. And if you have questions about what you need to do, there are so many people here that would love to help you answer those questions. But simply, in Romans chapter 10, we're told, He who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you're ready to call on the name of the Lord tonight, to, to have that answer of a good conscience, and to come forward and be buried in the watery grave of baptism, you'll be buried in that water, and you'll rise up a new creature, forgiven of your sins with that path laid out ahead of you. If you're willing to do that tonight, why do you wait? We don't know what tomorrow holds. Whatever your name may be, won't you please let us know now as we stand and sing.